did us pretty much all myself. All my life. Okay. But the agriculture business is interesting, and as any business was. And we went broke in 1974 when they put the price freeze on us. And we went broke in 1980 when the interest rates went to 21%. And I went broke in 1985 when the oil went bust. We found us kind of like, okay, God. Well, you're not true. Your bank and I finally agreed that I need to do something different. So I went to work for UPS load trucks because I had this little time frame at 5 o'clock in the morning where I wasn't really good enough. So I could work a little harder. And uh, I went to load trucks at UPS. And it was interesting. You know, I got to work in there right, right across the belt. I was loading four trucks. Everybody else was loading three. And, and right across from me was this preacher loading trucks at UPS. And, you know, it was interesting. And he just kept inviting me to his church. Right? He started a new church at the 4 H building at the fairgrounds and working at UPS. It was like, man, how bad must he be? And I'd go home and tell the boss, like, the preacher's inviting us to church. <laughs> He's working at UPS at 5 o'clock in the morning and preaching at the 4 H building. He must be really bad. <laughs> and we laughed. And he just kept inviting me for six months. <coughs> I want to come visit, I want to come visit. Well, finally, six months later, his wife's going to be out of town. Uh, so I said, I'm going to take the kids and we're going to go. I'm going to go, I'm going to go just so we quit inviting them. Let's get with the boys every week. So I load up the kids, go down there, and end up pulling up the 4 H building. There's only about 25 people there. I would walk in, and man, people were friendly and shaking hands. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. And they did praise and worship with the dead young little. And standing up and they, they sang off the wall. Remember, remember those days? But they, had the, they projected the thing up on the wall and singing. They just clapping and singing and raising their hands. And, you know, he grew up in a church where I'm not sure God approved of that. Anyways, they would sit there and they watch and listen. And his wife could play the piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a fun time. So um, when the music was over, she took the kids and went back to the children's church, so the kids went back with her. And this guy got up there and he started, said, go to this scripture, go to this scripture. First time in my life I've ever seen somebody teach the Bible. I'm 33 years old. I've had perfect attendance at my church. I, I'm surely good enough, you know. I've never seen anybody teach the Bible like him. I mean, he sat there and taught a lesson on the Bible. And when he got done, he said, now, if you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, come on up here and we'll pray with you. I was in there watching, making sure, you know, hey, this could get real, this could get interesting. Well, nobody went out that way. Okay? So we went home, he took the kids home, his wife got home, and said, Well, how was church? He said, Well, oh, you know, it's kind of different. You know, I grew up in the 60s, so I know the difference between weird and different. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I to understand that. Anyway, <laughs> so I said, It's kind of different, but it's kind of cool. Okay? The kids loved it. Oh, and by the way, Kent Cindy said to tell you She said, who? Well, Kent Cindy Crockett, that's the pastor that's been invited to this year. Why didn't you tell me it's Kent Cindy? Well, she met them months before down there because she used to take the kids to a little country church when I was working and running the cattle and I never went, but she knew it. So why didn't you tell me it's Kent Cindy? I said, well, I figured you knew it. So she got excited. So the next Sunday we'd go back, okay? And sure enough, we walk in there, 25, 30 people, and they're friendly, and they're clapping and singing, and she's banging on the piano, and she takes the kids back to children's church, and he gets up there, and he opens up the Bible, and he's teaching on, teaching on life. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that was in there. I didn't know that was in there. And when he got done, he said, now, if you don't know Jesus, come on up. You know what I mean? The Holy Spirit bring me. And I've gotten hard. Oh, it's hard. I went broke three times trying to pay attention so I come out to something. I've gotten bitter. You know what I went up there today? All those layers of hardness, all that bitterness come off me, and I'm in a mushy mess ever since. <laughs> that was the, not me 
mean, I was born again, truly. And I got so hungry for what was in this book he was teaching at. And I was so blessed for nine years, for three or four hours a day, I had him as a Bible study. There at UPS. I mean, he'd walk in the truck and I'd walk in the truck. And I'd ask him questions and he'd walk out and answer it. I mean, for nine years, I had to think about Then I joined his Bible study shortly after that. And he, his first Bible study was Revelation. Well, that was a revelation. Okay. <laughs> But I mentored him on business, he mentored me on the Bible, we became best friends, ended up being an elder, he put me on staff for nine years, and uh, he licensed me, and I've done the way for funerals, and a 180-foot cowboy that grew up some What was the main part of my story is I want to express to you today is about six months after I got saved, he had an author come in to teach on dad and family ship. It was all about the generation of curses and the generation of blessings. And I sat there that day and listened to all that. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me that you're a normal big generation of curse and your dad has no clue what it is. And I got so curious. As soon as it's over, I drove an hour and a half down, loaded my dad up in the vehicle, and we went for a ride. I said, Dad, what do you remember most about Grandpa? And it was almost instant. He said, I remember when I was about 13, he sent me to the mailbox a couple, up the road a couple of miles to get the mail in the old 38 plane. He said, I got up there and got the mail turned around, but then I noticed the car was about out of gas, so I'd rev it up and coast it. Then turn it back on, rev it up the coaster. Have you ever driven in a little flat end engine? What happens when you shut them off, turn it back on? Mm -hmm. Boom, they backfire, and man, you could hear it for miles. So he said, I did that two or three times to get back to the house. He said, when I pulled in the driveway, he was standing out there in the driveway with a quirk in his hand that I built for my pony, and he jerked me out of that car, and he beat me till I could hardly walk. <laughs> I said, that's what you remember most about your dad? Yeah. So let me take that one I remember most about you. When I was a fifth grader, you came down the basement screaming and yelling, and you grabbed me by one arm and you grabbed my little brother by the other, and you drug us out to the barn screaming and yelling. And the only thing you could find was a piece of conveyor belt that was hanging over a piece of wood up there, and you grabbed me and you beat me until I I thought was going to kill me. I was black and blue from my neck to my ankles. I told the coach in PE that I fell down in the capsule and they trampled on me because I sure wasn't feeling my dad beat me. I said, I'm 33 years old. I was hoop hoop in American teenagers. I was outstanding teenager of America. I was all state, all area football and basketball. I went to, went to junior college on a basketball scholarship so you would have to pay for it. I've tried all my life to hear the one word. I'm proud of you. I said, you not one time using all them ball games. I once did you ever tell me, good game, nice job. I remember the first calf I tied, Nate. I'm riding down to the arena. You're standing in the gate. And all you could say was, good thing you didn't jerk him down. He couldn't have been so fast. <laughs> I said, not one time you ever said he was proud of him. I said, well, girl, you didn't want to give you kids a big day. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I said, no, one time I heard you tell me you love me. That's been really hard to tell. They said, well, grow me and I'll give you the joints that I love. I said, well, it's been real hard. And I looked at him, I said, I just want you to know I'm so sorry for whooping all this bitterness. Resentment used to you all these years. Would you please forgive me? And I've learned that forgiveness is not about the receiver, it's all about the release. And man, I could feel the way the world just lift off of me. And that night when I left, I shook his hand and said, I love you. And he's kind of mumbled and said, well, whatever. But from that day on, because I decided I was going to break a curse, we have never parted what we don't shake hands or hug and he tells me to love you. Okay. And three years after that, well, I was speaking at an event there, 
And when we got done, he stood in the reception line for about 30 minutes and he came up and he shook my hand. <laughs> and he sure am proud of you. And I received the blessing. Gary Smalley calls the blessing. At 36 years old from a bed, who probably never got up in his bed because of the generational curse. So I've experienced it. I've experienced the effects of a generational curse. I've experienced the effects of a generational blessing. And what I see here today is an incredible generational blessing. Mr. Bill Crabtree is a man of He's an American hero. Yes. He had a vision and a dream and was brave enough and had courage enough to act on it. And look at the blessings of so many people and families that have got to participate in Okay? Now watch, you're in your third generation. Mr. Connor. Oh. Yeah. What a blessing. And it's so fun. Fun is a hard word for me because my dad beat all the fun out of me the time I was fifth grade. We know. But they say if discipline's not a memorable event, it will repeat it. I guarantee you we never rode the hogs again. <laughs> but I've learned that it's not what you do that creates your worth. It's who you are. That makes you worthy. And when I was able to receive total forgiveness, I was able to release total forgiveness. Forgiveness is such a powerful thing. And if you're a believer, you know that. You know what? I don't understand everything, how it all works. I mean, I don't understand trash. You know, how can you bring in three sacks of groceries and carry out ten sacks of trash? You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't understand how two hangers can be hung on a car and invariably they'll be hung up for it, try to get them out. Yeah. I don't understand how a dad can beat his sons and never encourage them any. I don't understand that because I broke that curse. I understand now why it happens. But I sure don't understand how a father can love his children enough to sacrifice his own son so that they can have forgiveness and receive forgiveness for their sins forever. Because none of us are perfect. I understand that, but I believe it. You know, and I believe some things that are facts, and I believe some things that are just faith. And I've never seen a million dollars. Anybody ever seen a million dollars? Do you believe it exists? We all believe it exists. People ask me, how do you believe in a God that you can't see? It's, it's easy. Look around. Just look around. I don't have enough faith to believe this all this happened with boom. <laughs> and if you do, man, I, I admire your faith because I don't have that much faith. There's a creator that created us to create. Thank you, Bill, for having the vision, for having the desire, to having the part in the action to create an environment and a family that we can all be such a blessing and be blessed. So as we close here right now, I just like everybody to join me as a word of prayer. I think we'll be done here in a minute.